Hi everyone, it's good to see you again this week. Uh, as you remember last week, we concluded our lesson with Joshua calling the Israelites to serve God. Remember, he always brought them back to Shechem once a year and reviewed with them all God had done from Genesis through at that time, it was just Deuteronomy. But he told them, don't forget, you need to remember. Because he said, I know times are hard. You're going to have a lot of distractors. You're going to have a lot of people, you know, come against you. Times are going to be hard. But it will be a whole lot easier to serve God when you remember all the good things, all the blessings, all the many times he's always been with you when you needed him. And when you do that, then you will serve him in obedience and because you love him, not because you have to. Now, it seems, though, that the people that Joshua was over at that time, they did serve God, and they were very good to do that, but they served God only until Joshua and those who experienced all those many things that he told them about, uh, all the miracles of conquering land, conquering that um, AI, whatever that was, and the, the many places that they had conquered, and the Gibeonites, remember, that we talked about, and so when those people had died, then the Israelites found it more difficult to serve God. They had focused more on trusting Joshua and the other leaders instead of having a personal relationship or a national trusting, um, national meaning that uh, not just for themselves, but trusting God for their nation and him protecting and preserving them in battles. And then that way they were trusting God as their true leader, not Joshua and the other men. Now, the Israelites seemed to be serving God out of an incorrect motive. They were serving God, so that was good, but it was an incorrect motive. And so do you ever think about, it says perhaps uh, they were trying to please Joshua and the other leaders. And it said, you know, can you have a good motive or a bad motive? Can you serve God and, and out of a bad motive? And of course you can. You can do things for him, and it's, so what's in it for me? So why is it more important or just as important that our behavior is not different depending on whether or not others are watching us? If we have a good motive, that's from our heart. That's why we're doing the action we're doing. But if we are wanting others to see us and approve of us, then that's more our visual, our visible actions. We're doing it so others will see us or so what can we get out of it? It seems though in our news today that everything we read, our moral compass, our, our morals are just uh, being more and more devastating. We're bombarded with evidence that the world is just losing their moral compass. And ancient Israel was a lot like that too, especially after Joshua died. But they had a spiritual king, and it was King Jesus. And God was always there. He had a covenant with them, and he said, as long as you love me, I will take care of you. You don't have to worry. And it worked for Joshua and those other leaders. And the other people just, uh, it was happening, but they were basing it on Joshua's faith. Joshua had faith, and so things were happening. The people didn't necessarily have that faith. So when, when, they, when they were gone, then the people didn't have strong a faith to believe that God was going to take care of them. Something that was spiritual was harder to get their mind around, and that's the same way we are today. They wanted a physical king that they could see, and so that's what they were demanding. We want a king like other nations, they said. Now, we kind of like that today. They were wanting to change the way that their life was going due to political influence. And we do that today. I mean, we're getting ready to elect a president, uh, whether it's a new one or uh, extending the other one. So it said, as Christians, we have more than just that political, have that way of changing our political compass uh, in that because we're Christians, we can pray and allow King Jesus to change our environment and to solve our spiritual problems. And that's what uh, the Israelites, they had problems 
but they thought they were political problems that could be solved by a king when they really had spiritual problems. So it said, um, do you think God ever intended that they have a king? The people wanted a king. Well, of course, he wanted them to have a king. He was a king. He had in mind that he was going to have King David. But if you're reading in where our lesson goes today, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, it doesn't sound like Jesus wanted a king. Um, based on that scripture, it said up to this time, scripture had never prevented them from having a king. And that's because they believed in, um, they believed in God through Joshua's leading. They really didn't have a reason not to have a king. Uh, the covenant was there and they had, remember we talked about a Caesarian treaty last week and that's the kind of treaty of ancient um, Israel where they had a powerful king, which would be God, and his subordinate kingdom, which would be Israel. Now, Israel didn't mind being the subordinate. They knew that God could do a lot more for them than they could do. And so they were fine with that. They would do whatever their strong king wanted them to do. And that was the problem now is they no longer saw that they had a strong king. They did not see Jesus as a strong king. They wanted um, a, a king that was not spiritual but was uh, visible. Now, Samuel was who was um, a judge at this time. And uh, Samuel had been a godly prophet and a priest and a judge. But as it says in uh, verse 4, it said, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Well, Samuel knew he was old, and so he did give his uh, judgeship to his two sons. They were not godly. And so they would take bribes, and so things went according to the way people won them to go if they had enough money. And so they wanted a, a regular king. So it says, for years the Israelites then suffered oppression from those around them due to their own disobedience of God's law. And that was a fact that they wanted a king. However, they thought the solution to their problems would be to have a king like all the other nations. And in 1 Samuel 8, we are going to learn that the root of this issue was not that the people, was that the people were rejecting God as their king. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, God outlined what you needed to do to be a king. He said you couldn't have too much gold or silver, that the king couldn't, uh, that had to be Jewish. They couldn't have too many animals because animals, like horses, he saw as them building an army. If you had lots of horses, that meant that you could go back, and he did not want them to go back um, to Egypt and try to conquer them. And so he wanted them to look to God as their conqueror and that they didn't need an army as their conqueror. So that's why he didn't want them to have too, to make too big of an army or have horses is the way he saw it. Also, a king would have to rewrite the Bible in his own hand and then study it and read it every day. So God had a plan for a strong, capable leader similar to Moses, Joshua, and Samuel. And if they did all the things that he outlined, which Moses, Joshua, and Samuel did, then he'd be fine. But the underlying issue was the motive that the Israelites wanted a king. He did not mind them saying they wanted a king. He could kind of understand that, but it was why they wanted a king. The Israelites had forsaken God from the very beginning. The book of Judges precedes this book of Samuel that we're studying today. And that's why Samuel was a judge and we had judges at that time. And so they went for a period of time where they did not have a designated leader. They were following God through their judges and their prophets. And so that's what uh, the book of Judges talks about. So now we have the book of Samuel and it records a time after Joshua and that's where we have Judges, Joshua then Judges. It records that time after Joshua 
when there was no strong central leader and it seemed like they were in a cycle of sin and oppression. It was spiraling out of control. Well, Samuel came along at the end of Judges and it seems that the people saw that they had a problem then and they thought it was a political deficiency. They hadn't had a good central leader and so if Samuel could get them a good leader and that's what Samuel did is he was the go-between uh, God and the people. And he knew that God didn't want them to have a king, but he told God about it because the people thought they had a political deficiency when they actually had a spiritual deficiency. They thought if they just had a king, then he would go to these other nations that were giving them so much hard time, this oppression, and that uh, he would fight their battles and that would just cut off and defeat that cycle of oppression. Well, uh, Israel's problem was a result that they had forsaken their promise to follow the Lord in the covenant. Because he said, as long as you follow me, you don't have to worry. They had forsaken God by partaking in idolatry. And they had forsaken him as their king. They had forsaken Samuel. They were not, um, he was the appointed prophet at that time. And he was going to be their leader if they would listen to him. And because he would lead them to God. But Samuel would ultimately have to anoint Saul as their king. God tried to steer them away, but he these were his people. He loved the Israelites. They were his chosen people. And he said, if that's what they want, I will help them do that. I want to bless them. So God even uh, told Samuel about Saul and selected Saul as the next king. Because he didn't want the people serving him because they were robots. He didn't want to make them serve him. Say, no, you don't get a king. You're going to serve me or else. No, he didn't want robots. So he said, okay, if you think you can serve me better by having a king, then I'll get you a king. But remember, God has a plan. It will not be thwarted. But this came in. They won the king. He saw that they got a king. He pretty well knew it wasn't going to work because that was not his plan. The motive for the king was wrong. He wanted to give them a freedom of choice so that they weren't serving him out with robots. But it's not going to go well. So Samuel's going to anoint Saul now. And he was going to be the kind of king that the people wanted. And David then would be the ruler who sought God for direction. So David was who he wanted, but he wasn't ready yet. So God answered Israel's request, gave them what they wanted. He chose a king with the um, features and uh, the qualities that he thought the people wanted, which was he was tall, dark, and handsome. The people were very, very happy. And he looked like he would be a good king, and God chose him. So uh, they knew that it was important that God had chosen him. But Saul was still a human, and he had a choice he, of how he was going to conduct his own life and how he was going to conduct the nation's life. Was he going to listen to God? Was he going to um, do what God told him to do, even if he did hear it? Well, we have two different pictures of uh, Saul. Because how did Saul happen to go there? It was a fact that his father had some donkeys, a herd of donkeys, and they, um, they got lost. Or at any rate, he didn't know where they were. So he told Saul to take an assistant and take some provisions and go look for them. And so that's how he came to be in Israel. But... It was all according to God's plan because Samuel was told there'll be a man that comes through here and this is what he looks like and he's tall, dark, and handsome and that is who you'll pick for the new king. Of course, they still had to go to, through the preliminaries for choosing a king. So when Samuel saw Saul come through, he knew that he was there. So they cast lots and they chose which tribe would have the new king. So when they cast lots, it said that it would be the tribe of Benjamin. And then when they cast lots again, it would be the clan of Judah. 
And then when they cast lots again, then all the qualified men from Judah were in that lot. And in that, coincidentally, then Saul got chosen. But it was all planned. It was going to happen anyway. Well, when uh, Saul comes through, Samuel tells him what's going to happen. So here he is, just a common, ordinary man looking for a herd of mules. And he gets to a town and he said, you're going to be our new king. Well, this scared him spitless. So he goes into hiding. Well, then they go through and they do everything. And the people are told that Saul's going to be their new king. And they go, but we can't even find him. And God said, well, that, that's not, you know, I know where he is. You know, God knows everything. So he got him out of hiding. And um, Samuel told him, I'll be around. You know, I'll be, you know, I've done this for a long time. And, um... I will be here as your guidance, and I will, you know, if you listen to me, we'll uh, seek God for it. And so Saul was comforted in that. And for two years, he sought God, and he did what God wanted him to do. And so uh, he was happy, and he felt more secure. Saul's physical stature was that he was tall, dark, and handsome. And in ancient times, if you were tall, they told you you were long. So that's where the... Um, phrase long live the king came from but also it was a very stark contrast to David because remember David's gonna come in and he's not tall and he's not dark and he is not particularly handsome at the time he's a 15 year old ruddy is what they described him as being but Saul started out like I said it's a good man but he just couldn't overcome his impetuousness. Impetuousness means that you are impulsive, but you're also violent. And so he was uh, violently impulsive. He lacked regard for God's word uh, through Samuel. Samuel was there and available to uh, guide him, but he wouldn't follow the directions that God was giving through Samuel. So, of course... Samuel thought, you know, I endorsed him. I, you know, encouraged the people to, you know, go ahead and have this king. So he felt responsible. And so he grieved that Saul was not a good king. And God came to him. He said, get over it, Samuel. We need to move on. We need another king. And so uh, he was anointed uh, Israel's second. He said, we need to anoint a second king, which would be David. So Samuel anointed David, but it was some time before David would actually uh, serve or go to come to the throne. So that just reminds us, God can anoint people to do things, but it may be some time before they actually do that. It's according to, uh, we've got to understand that our expectations aren't God's expectations in timing. I mean, look at Moses. He was a baby when he was chosen. And he was 80 years old for uh, he saw God in the burning bush and God told him what he wanted him, to, wanted him to do. And Saul was chosen as a king. It's a promise you'll be on the uh, you'll be on the throne. That's what God promised him. And so, like I said, when God makes a promise, it's promised. But it was going to be 38 more years. He ruled for 40 altogether. The first two were good. The next 38 was when Samuel was grooming David. So the decision by God to choose a different king was due to two separate actions. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we see that Saul's impetuousness uh, was because he offered a sacrifice when he had uh, went to battle with the Pil Philistines. Uh, God had told him to wait seven days and that Samuel would be along and they would offer a proper sacrifice, but he didn't wait. And then in chapter 15, Saul uh, was sent to kill the Amalites and he said, just practically wipe them off the earth, destroy them. Well, he, he didn't kill the Amalite king. He saved some of the better people. And he also allowed his soldiers to keep some of the good uh, livestock. He said, I just wanted to offer a good sacrifice to God. I wanted some of the better animals, but that was not true at all. He told God and said, I said, destroy everything. I'm your God. I can provide you with whatever you need. You don't need any of this other stuff. 
So on both of those occasions, Samuel prophesied to God that, or prophesied that God was going to take his kingdom away and he was going to take it away from his heirs because when God chose Saul, it was to be for the rest of his life and his children's lives. It was forever. He was the forever king because he would take the place of David. But God knew it wasn't going to work and David eventually would come in. But at when Saul was chosen, it was forever. And it said that in verse 13, because it would be Saul and all of his heirs. So Samuel went to Bethlehem to anoint a new dynasty of Israel for the descendants of Jesse. So initially, Samuel looked at all of his sons, and one was called Eliab, but he was tall, dark, and handsome. So he said, hmm, I, I bet he's going to be the one that's going to be chosen. But uh, appearance, he thought, uh, by his appearance that he's the one that was going to be chosen. But God was not concerned with anointing someone that looked good. God was concerned with the heart of that man. So all seven of Jesse's sons, or seven of his eight sons, were brought in. And uh, Samuel just knew that Eliab was going to be chosen. But God said, no, none of these of them. And he said, ask him if he has another son. So Samuel said, oh, do you have another son? And he said, well, just my youngest one. He's out tending the sheep. He's only 15 years old, and he's ready. But, okay, I'll bring him in. So he did. David was described as being ruddy. We don't know if that means he had red hair or a red face. But he was out in the uh, elements uh, tending to the sheep, so it could have meant he just had a real ruddy uh, complexion. But whatever the specifics... Samuel was anointed, uh, or Samuel did anoint David with the oil in the presence of his brothers. So his brothers knew that he was anointed king. But the Spirit of God came all over him that very day and from that day forward. And so there was no denying that God had chosen him. <clears throat> so David followed Samuel for many, many years, and Samuel groomed him and showed him the way of a king. Well, throughout the New Testament, the people of Israel referred to Moses as a great lawgiver, but David was always referred to as a great king. But just like all the other humans, and just like us, they were not perfect. Uh, they failed to obey God at times, and so bad so that they were not allowed to do certain things. We know Moses was prohibited from entering the promised land because he disobeyed God. And we know that David was not allowed to build a temple. So as the historical books of scripture, there's much overlapping in the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. It's just like the four gospel. You're going to hear the same story in Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles because they all end up uh, tell us a little bit more about how things were going at this time. But the important thing to note is Chronicles was often, um, well, Chronicles was written after the fall of Judah. Um, at this time, we don't even have a temple. And uh, Chronicles was written after the temple had been destroyed. So a lot's going to take place in this time. The depiction of David in Chronicles is that he was, like I said, he had a lot of mistakes, but the depiction in Chronicles is that he was just a really great guy. It focused on all of his positives. It didn't tell about Bathsheba. It didn't tell about the attempted coup with Absalom. David was plenty flawed, but in the context of Chronicles, it's going to focus on the traits that made him one of God's own and after God's own heart, the, the kind of king that God thought they um, deserved. It also reiterated in First Chronicles chapter 17 that David was chosen while he was still tending to flocks because God saw of what the good God saw in him, not what other people saw in him. So it was in this passage that God came out and said, um, that his, his throne would last forever because David wanted to defer his own comfort. He said, I live in a beautiful house of cedar, and the temple of God, meaning the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, has no permanent resting place. And so it needs a permanent resting place before I ever get a, a, a castle of my own. And so God 
respected that, that, that David thought that uh, the Ark of the Covenant needed a home before David did, or before, yeah, before David did. Um, so it was in the time of the Chronicles that the people of Judah and Babylon in the Babylonian exile were reeling because everything had just been destroyed. Like I said, um, the temple has to be built and you know uh, destroyed in this time. And so they remembered that God said that David's throne would be forever. And here they were looking at a temple that had been totally destroyed. So the people of Judah in Babylon uh, were reassured that the promise would be fulfilled, but it wouldn't be until the time of Jesus. So in the genealogy of, Je of Jesus in Matthew, we see a second section of 14 generations um, of the kings of Judah. And they came after Solomon because it was Solomon that built the temple. Remember, David wasn't allowed to. His son built it. And so after Solomon, after that first temple, then we see 14 more generations and then in the time of Christ what then the throne would continue so he the promise was given to David had been fulfilled through Jesus direct descent from David and Jesus would be the ultimate fulfillment of first chronicles 17:14 when he said his meaning David's throne will be established forever because it would come through David well, God did not allow David to build that temple because David had been a man of war. And the temple would instead be built by David's son Solomon. He, he wasn't perfect either, but he did reign in peace. And although Solomon later disobeyed God, the temple was built and it was a long-standing symbol of God's presence among the people. Now, have you ever wondered tem temple and tabernacle? Um, tabernacle is referring to the tent that the Ark of the Covenant was in. Temple is referring to a building. So when you hear tabernacle, they're referring to a tent. When you hear temple, that is the permanent residence of the Ark of the Covenant. So the temple was destroyed by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, and that's when they were going to go into exile. Then it was rebuilt after the exile by Ezra, then it was enhanced even more under King Herod. And King Herod, when he uh, enhanced the temple, that was in the time of Jesus. And then it was destroyed again in 70 AD. And that's after the death of Christ, but Christ died 30 AD. And so it was about 40 more years after Christ lived that the temple, as it had been enhanced under Herod, was destroyed by the Romans. So as stated uh, before, the books of Chronicles were written after the fall of the kingdom of Judah. So that, that means when they went into exile. And that was around 586 BC. So although the books seem repetitive of the books of Samuel and Kings, there's a subtle difference that they emphasized. David was not allowed to build the temple but it did say in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 uh, that David extensively planned. He knew all, he planned everything about that temple, and then he passed those on to his son Solomon. So in 1 Chronicles, we have David doing the planning of the temple, and in 2 Chronicles, we have Solomon building the temple. And the emphasizing how Solomon began his reign very well. Uh, he asked for wisdom at the onset. He went to Gibeon where the tabernacle had stood and he offered thousands of burnt offerings to the brazen altar built during the time of Moses. And so he was, the tabernacle where it stood, the tent is what he's talking about. So Second Chronicles chapter 6 verse 1 through 11 forms the beginning of, of a series of speeches by Solomon to dedicate the completed temple. So the temple was filled with the glory of the Lord because that's where God was going to be. That's where the people could go find God is in the temple. Those are the exact same words you will read in Exodus chapter 40 
when they made the tent, the tabernacle. They said, and his uh, presence filled it with glory. In fact, Moses tried to go in when they had the first stone tablets and they built that tent for it. And Moses tried to go in there and there was such a cloud that it just threw him off his feet because the presence of God was so strong, he could not go in there. So at the completion of the tabernacle, you read that, and that reflected God's promise to dwell with his people. So he, first, God is with his people in the tent, and then afterwards he is with them in the temple, and then when that was all done away with, he's in our hearts now. So God is with us all the time in our hearts, in our body. Because God said he would always dwell with his people and he made his presence visible in their midst. So the summary of God's activity from Exodus to his promise to David, the building of the temple, all underscore the foundational statement in chapter 6 verse 10 that the Lord kept his promise that he made. All along he said his throne would last forever and he completed that. Everything in the Old Testament is about God didn't come to do away with those um, tablets. He came to fulfill the tablets. Then he walked on earth, and then it goes back to what he did Then when, after he walked on earth. So people around us can see the hand of God in our lives in many ways. In 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 9, verse 1 through 8, the Queen of Sheba recognized that God had really blessed Solomon, both in a lot of wealth and his obedience to God in offering sacrifices. Well, it's just like anybody. You know, if they say if a church is on fire, people will come and watch it burn. Well, that's the way it was with Solomon. He was doing huge, mighty things, and people were attracted to him. And so likewise, people today should be able to see God in our lives if we're active through our actions, our attitudes, as well as how obedient we are to him. So our church, if it's on fire for God, people going to come and they want to see it. We will attract that attention and Solomon attracted that attention. So Sheba, she was a queen of Sheba. So that means uh, her name wasn't Sheba. It just meant that's where she was from. And it may refer to the kingdom in Ethiopia. Uh, it's also an Arabian kingdom that we call Yemen today. And they were known for their uh, frankincense and myrrh. You heard of those in the, when the Christ child, the, the guys brought the frankincense and myrrh, the wise men. Well, frankincense and myrrh were so highly valued you could practically say the words gold and silver, and it was equal to them because frankincense and myrrh is where Sheba came, uh, was, they were uh, noted for that. So this queen of Sheba came from a lot of wealth also, but she had heard how Solomon was blessed and how much wealth he had, and she said, I I don't believe this until I see it. And that's the way a lot of people are when they hear that someone they knew is serving God and he's blessing them and it's like seeing is believing I want to see this and so that's why Solomon is a type of Christ uh, she had heard how good it was and she said seeing is believing and when she got there she said it's better than I heard so anyway um, this queen came to visit Solomon because she had heard the great stories of his wealth and wisdom and she was a overwhelmed by both of them. But the key principle here is that someone on the outside had taken note of what God's people had attested to. And that was a fact that God should be praised for delighting in, Sam, in Solomon. And she told Solomon, you ought to be so honored that God had made you king and he entrusted you with maintaining justice and righteousness. And that's kind of how others on the outside see is, is when they find out how God blesses us, it's like to know that you are that honored. Do you see how honored and blessed that you are? And that we should take that, you know, uh, more seriously. That when God comes into a, 
our hearts and blesses us that we should see and honor him for loving us that much that he would trust us with being his hand extended with bringing others to him so the king of uh, the queen of sheba was so impressed by what god had done through solomon and uh, it said that you know he could have got a big head over this and that that's something we need to guard against that when people come and say do you see how blessed you are that we should not be distracted by the fact that people see how blessed we are and um, we're actually being distracted from what drew them to us in the first place that God was blessing us and so if we start taking on uh, that we are a hero or we've done something great. We're not the hero. We were just the, the tool that was used. And so we don't want to be distracted from our commitment to God by the cultural emphasis on how great we are because we're just an instrument. Well, we're in these time of elections now. And so when we seek our leaders a lot of times we look at their oratory, their physical appearance, their political gifts, yet God was not concerned with those things. Remember, he was concerned with David's heart. So God wants us to evaluate our leaders, our president that we will be electing based on his heart. We can be examples also to the world by being Christ-like amid the temptations of a modern culture. So these are words you just need to pray that God will keep you faithful as you become more like Christ and that he will help you overcome the temptations of the culture around you and he will give you opportunities to share the joy and the freedom of a life devoted to Christ and that God will help you focus on those who encounter we encounter on a daily basis and that we will have the commitment to share the love and grace of Christ with them. So in these times, they're hard, and we need to show our love, our Christian love, to others. So I hope you come back next week. Uh, we're still in the Old Testament. The U A United Kingdom Divided. We're going to be studying Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings next week. So please join in. Bye-bye.